Please stay tuned for important disclosure information at the conclusion of this episode. Hi, and welcome to The Long View. I'm Christine Benz, Director of Personal Finance and Retirement Planning for Morningstar. And I'm Jeff Patak, Chief Ratings Officer for Morningstar Research Services. Our guest on the podcast today is Charles Rotblood. Charles is Vice President at the American Association of Individual Investors, and he's also editor of the AAII Journal. Charles wrote the book, Better Good Than Lucky, which was published in 2010, and he's a CFA charter holder. Charles, welcome to The Long View. Thanks for having me. Let's start by talking a little bit about AAII or AAII, American Association of Individual Investors. How did it get started and what is its mission? Sure. So we were started in 1978 by James Clunan. Um, At the time, he was a professor at the University of DePaul. He had also previously run an options firm. And back then, one of the things he noticed was that there just was not many resources for individual investors, including on how to invest, how to manage their portfolios. Uh, There are some books some schemes, but there really wasn't much formalized for individual investors, a resource they could tap to really learn what they should do. And so Jim, from his experience working in options and also I think just from being a professor, uh, saw an opportunity to really create an organization that could help individual investors. And the idea from AAII and even the original founding of AAII really started from Jim's kitchen table. Um, He, his wife, Edie, played a big role in starting that. And it started really as a family affair and it just grew from there. And our mission has never changed throughout the uh, now more than 40 years. And that's really to empower individual investors to become effective managers of their own assets. And we try to do that through education, through information, and through research. But that whole time, we've been a nonprofit and we've never lost sight of our bigger goals, which is really helping individual investors become better portfolio managers of their own portfolios. AAI appeals to a lot of investment hobbyists, if we can call them that. And it's open to a lot of different ways of investing. Is that part of the philosophy of AAI that there's no single way to investment success? It is sort of. We um, internally, we do have a bias towards value investing, a bias towards small company investing, because historically, those are the two parts of the market from a stock standpoint that have realized the highest returns uh, if you go back to the 1920s. But we realize every individual investor is different. Uh, I've seen some studies that say whether you're a value investor or if you're a growth investor depends on both how you're born, really nature, and then also your upbringing and what type of upbringing you grew up in. And so we do have a lot of members, a lot of varied Uh, investing philosophies, and we do try to accommodate them. When I personally speak, one of the first slides I often show simply says that the optimal strategy is the one you can stick with no matter what the market's doing. And so some of our members, they're diehard indexers. Some of them are really strong growth investors. Some are deep value. We have a lot of members who use technical analysis and all sorts of different degrees in between. So We don't try to pigeonhole our members into you must do value, you must be small cap. We talk about it, we show them the numbers, we have examples, uh, but we make a lot of other strategies available to them. In fact, on our website, we have close to 60 predefined stock screens and there's growth in there, there's dividends in there, uh, there's value, there's momentum. So it really spans the gambit. And we're more concerned with really just helping members to be disciplined and find a you know a strategy that works well for them as opposed to saying here's strategy A and don't vary from it because I don't think that fits the reality of most investors. So what compels a member to join AAII? What do you offer an investor that he or she couldn't get on their own, especially given the profusion of data and enabling technology that's now available to do it yourself investors? Yeah, it's interesting you ask that because I think for a lot of individual investors, it's turned from maybe a a small stream of knowledge back in the 70s to now where there's almost a fire hose on full blast. And if you're trying to step up to it and take a drink of water, uh, you're going to get blown down the street. 
for us, we really try to boil down things to really providing knowledge, providing information, providing research. And as a nonprofit, we're not making any money off of our members in terms of how they do their investments. We're not trying to sell them specific products, say mutual funds or advice. Our goal really is education. And one of the nice things about working at AAI is that we are able to bring in a lot of experts from both academia uh, and practitioners. I myself, I've been at AI for actually now 12 years. Uh, and during that time, I've had the luxury to sit down with four different Nobel laureates. And I've been able to actually share the conversations with the AI journal. So even though there's a lot of information out there, we really try to think about what information is credible, what insights can we bring members. And so even when I talk to fund managers, it's not what are you holding in your portfolio, but trying to have that deeper conversation of how are you investing? What are you looking at? What's your strategy? Why? So we offer that, but we also offer various tools, mutual fund guides, ETF guides, screeners, uh, portfolio tools, and all of us really making the content at AI, we're all individual investors. And so we're constantly thinking about what challenges do individual investors have? How can we address them and how can we help them? So we're really trying to not only provide a, a wide range of information from a variety of experts, but really do so in a way that helps individual investors solve the problems and solve the challenges they're facing. I'd imagine that for some of your members, part of the appeal of AII is the in-person engagement. You can offer the meetings as a social outlet or a learning experience. How has AII adapted to the pandemic given that in-person meetings are mostly on hold for now. Yeah, it was a really radical shift. So if you go back to uh, March 2020, uh, we basically had to put everything on hold. We were supposed to hold a conference at the Paris Hotel in Las Vegas in November 2020. For obvious reasons, that got canceled. But we immediately did a, a switch, and we had been talking about doing more things digitally, more things online. Uh, and when the pandemic happened, we just really accelerated those efforts. So most of our local chapters, and we have close to 40 local chapters in major cities across the country, they're volunteer run. Uh, most of them are still meeting via Zoom. Uh, we've given them protocols if they want to go back to in-person meetings. So far, that hasn't happened, mostly because the Delta variant has made that unappealing. But we have turn to facilitating their meetings uh, via Zoom. We had talked internally about doing webinars. We quickly pivoted to putting on webinars ourselves. Uh, even in the early days of the pandemic, I just called up my uh, iPad and started just shooting videos right off the bat to communicate to our members. And then this year, we did a conference virtually. Uh, we made the decision really late last year, early this year, before we had much clarity about what was going to happen with the virus. So we quickly made the pivot, uh, did our first virtual conference. And so we're thinking, you know, going forward more about digital, but we do realize there's still an avenue for in-person meetings. We're empowering our local chapters to make that decision based on what they feel comfortable with, because obviously... The coronavirus restrictions varies by geography, so we're letting those local groups, which are volunteer-run, make their own decisions. For ourselves here at the national organization, we are still doing digital. We are, as terms of our conference, uh, we're looking out in the future and trying to plan what that looks like. Because obviously, in a you know post-COVID or at least a post-pandemic COVID world, uh, that could change how things occur, and we're. We're studying that right now. What does that future look like? Well, yeah, I wanted to ask about that, Charles, because Jeff and I have now done a few podcasts where we've talked to retirement experts about the benefits of socialization throughout our lives, but uh, perhaps especially as we age. So how do you kind of think about that? What gets lost as you move to, you know, mostly virtual sort of meeting environment? Do you feel that that will be hard for a lot of your members to transition away from gathering in person? I'm sure it has been hard so far. Yeah, I think it depends on, on the member and how comfortable how comfortable they are uh, getting on Zoom. We 
are doing more digital engagement. Uh, really, just a couple of weeks ago, we launched our online community um, and really an online forum where AI members can gather together, discuss. Um, we call it a collective mind where they can tap into. So we are trying to engage them digitally, uh, but there are certain things you do lose when you're not in person. Uh, we use the term hallway conversations where you see people talk in the hallway. I know when I've speak, Kristen, you've probably had the same thing too. Uh, if I'm answering questions after a presentation, I'll see, you know, a, a few people actually surrounding me and some of those people are just standing there wanting to hear other members' questions. So even though we can engage online, engage digitally, there still is something to be said about meeting in person that's really hard to uh, replicate online. And I think as we go forward, we're going to consider that and try to figure out what is the right mix and what is the right balance. Right now, to be honest with you, we don't have a clear answer. And I don't think we're alone either. We're obviously things that have changed pretty drastically over the last 18 or so months. And so we're trying to, uh, as we move past, uh, hopefully we've seen a last surge in the virus. And, and as we move past that, trying to figure out how events are and how we actually host events and on what type of platform we host events. How has your membership changed since the pandemic? We've seen an explosion in traders and speculators, but you know, have you also seen a swell of new investors who maybe share your philosophy and worldview and were drawn to the organization for that reason? So our membership has risen a little bit. Um, we're fortunate that a large portion of our membership are life members. Um, Ballpark, about 60% of our members are actually bought a lifetime membership. So they pay once and they're members. But we have, we've been seeing membership growing. Our membership does tend to skew older. And I saw the same thing. I used to work at uh, Invest Tools and Telescan. And I worked at Zach's and it was that same demographic where it usually tends to be older demographic that tends to get involved in individual investor services. But when we look at our web stats, we are seeing a broad range in terms of age groups from really, you know, 20s and 30s, 40s and 50s, 60s and 70s. Those brackets that Google Analytics is looking at shows us there's actually a mix of people engaging online. And ourselves, we've been relying more on digital marketing. We're on Facebook uh, advertising. We have Facebook groups. We send a lot of electronic newsletters. So we are seeing a younger audience coming in. Every place I've worked at in the individual investor space has been that older demographic. And I, my theory is that people get to a certain age where either they haven't managed their finances themselves or maybe to a point where they have a large enough nest egg where they realize they really need to take control of it. I think that's at play, but I think there's also a certain level of experience where maybe if you're younger, maybe you don't think you quite need as much help or maybe you're going through Unfortunately, we see this over and over, this evolution where I'm going to trade more aggressively. I'm going to like chase after what's hot now. You go through that, fray, that phase, you get burned once, maybe you get burned twice, and then you start going through the evolution of, well, maybe there's a better way. Maybe I need to take a step back and figure out how do I really do this and how do I really take advantage of what everybody says is the benefits of long-term investing. Well, I wanted to pick up on that given the trading of things like crypto and NFTs and SPACs among individuals, what's your take on the whole YOLO boom that we've been seeing over the past year and a half? I'm especially curious to get your perspective because you've lived through a lot of different eras that have seen investors flit from one hot fad to the next. Yeah, Christine, this really feels like it's the um, dot-com bubble all over again. A lot of similarities, we're seeing people day trading. They have access at the time in the 1990s. The big things everyone had access to online brokerage accounts, E-Trade for the first time, Merit Trade for the first time. Um, and now instead of that, you have Robinhood. And instead of commissions being, oh, it's only $9.95 or $12.95 or whatever those commissions are, now it's free. And if I have 100 bucks, well, I can still buy a, a fraction of Tesla. Um, so I think definitely things have changed a little bit, but I think we do continuously see these waves. I think it's human history. Um, Sam Stovall uses the phrase that history doesn't always repeat, but it rhymes. And I think that's a good phrase here that we're saying that 
people always want to buy into those bubbles. We saw the dot-com bubbles. We saw the housing bubble. Uh, if you go back through history, you saw at one point bowling alleys and anything bowling related was a hot thing. You obviously had bicycles uh, in England at one point, and we can obviously go back several hundred years to where tulip bulbs were the big hot thing. So it seems to be this ongoing process where people don't understand history and they somehow think now is different. And I just think we're unfortunately seeing history repeat itself. And while there have been some people that have probably done really well, I think there's a large number of people that really misjudged, maybe bought too late, or didn't realize how volatile some of these assets are. And unfortunately, you know, learn a pretty costly lesson. And I hate seeing people go through that, but it just seems to be part of human behavior. What about the role of, call them frictions in the process? You already alluded to the fact that with enabling technology, it's easy to trade freely. And in some ways that's great. You know, it gets more people involved in other ways you know, maybe it enables some of our worst and most self-destructive impulses. What's your perspective as somebody that's looked on, you know, sort of investors through the years? Yeah, I definitely think when you make things easier to do, you start separating yourselves. And there's a study several years ago of behavioral finance. And what they found on that study, that if people go into a store with cash in hand, they spend less than if they use credit cards because when you have that credit card, you have the detachment where you're spending now, but you're paying later. And now when you're looking at Robinhood, it's very easy to trade. They used to give people confetti when they first placed their trade, and I understand they've stopped that now. But I think the fact that when it's made too easy to trade, um, you do lose that moment to actually take a step back and think about what am I doing? And one of the things I've told investors for years is before you place a trade, just stand up for a second, you know, take five deep breaths and then stop and take a look at it. Uh, because it's just simply, it's easy to make mistakes. Maybe you wanted to buy and you click sell. Maybe you wanted to buy 20 shares and you accidentally typed 200. Or maybe you just typed in the ticker symbol wrong. It's just simple human error. And just by taking a step back, it allows you to take a look at your screen. But I think when somebody's in an excited state where they're hearing, um, you know, maybe they're looking at rent a runway and they saw that just went public and they're really excited about it. Just getting that little bit of break might get you a chance to stop and think, do I really want to place this trade? What do I know about the stock? Am I making the right decision? And I think that applies to trading. And obviously now we have the sports betting apps. And I think it's the same type of thing where it's too easy to engage in a behavior we tend to revert to our impulses versus if there's some type of barrier, just something that just stops you for a second and helps you reset your brain and really start to think through what you're doing. It doesn't necessarily stop you completely, but sometimes just having that moment of detachment can make a big difference. Some of the AAII members are incredibly savvy about their investments, and they've done a great job of managing their portfolios and their finances. How do you counsel them to safeguard their finances against cognitive decline? And I'm also curious whether you think even dedicated do-it-yourself investors might engage an advisor as they age rather than continuing to manage things on their own. Yeah, I, when I talk about portfolio strategies, I always bring it up. And when I first started doing it, um, I've said talking to people who might be in their 70s, might be older. And when I first started doing it, I literally thought they were going to come at me with pitchforks and torches because I'm sitting in front of them saying, basically, here's the data. You're going to lose your mind and lose your ability to manage your finances. But what's interesting, when I do talk about it, I usually see people very engaged or paying a lot of attention. And it's a very serious risk. And something I don't think it's talked about enough because there's a growing amount of evidence showing one of the first signs of cognitive decline is your inability to manage your finances. And it's not just your ability to manage your portfolio, it's even balancing your checkbook, uh, paying your bills on time. And so I think one of the things people can do is just engage an outsider. Maybe you know it's a child they trust, Maybe it's a close friend they trust, or maybe it's a financial advisor. But I think it's very helpful to have someone at least looking over their shoulder 
Another big thing is a lot of banks, a lot of financial institutions now allow people to list a trusted contact. And a trusted contact is someone who can be called if a representative of the financial firm suspects something's going on that's just not right. Uh, for instance, maybe you have an older adult uh, shows up at the bank and suddenly wants to withdraw $15,000 and there's someone staying next to them that the bank teller has never seen before. It gives the teller the ability to call you know, that child or perhaps a close relative or the advisor and say, you know what, I've got Bob here, I've got Sue here, and they wanna make this big withdrawal, and I'm a little bit concerned that they're not thinking through things. So I think that's a big help, but I think people need to realize it's a real threat as they progress through retirement. And I think it's also important to realize that whenever you're dealing with cognitive issues, whether we're dealing with Alzheimer's, uh, if we're dealing with some other form of dementia, you start forgetting what you used to remember. And so it's really easy sometimes for people not to realize that they're not cognizant of what's going on. I certainly know people uh, who are denial about you know, their cognitive decline. I've had conversations with friends where they've had, you know, a parent that, you know, even though multiple doctors have said you have Alzheimer's, they're insisting they don't. Um, and so it's it's very important to people realize that you may not realize you have it or you might be in denial. And when you're in denial about it, you may be showing signs of it, but because you're denying it, you may not be realizing you're showing signs of it. So it's, I think it is really important to have those safeguards in place. Uh, so maybe someone else can at least step in and maybe give you a nudge or say, hey, let's sit down and let's figure out what's going on before something really bad happens. Let's shift gears a bit and talk about the AAII sentiment survey, which your organization is well known for. Maybe we can start with basics. How do you gauge sentiment and how should investors, in your opinion, use the survey, if at all, to inform their own investment decisions? Sure. So the survey itself has, we've been asking it since 1987, and the question has never changed. It's simply, over the next six months, I feel the market will be up bullish, down bearish, or relatively flat, which is neutral. Uh, the only thing that's really changed with the survey is sometime in the 1990s, we used to mail out postcards and count the postcards by hand each week, and now everything's done online. But because we have this large amount of data, we're able to go back and look at things and see how it's correlated with market moves. And even though there's that old saying about that people should buy when there's blood on the streets, what we found with our sentiment survey really is optimism and not pessimism that's the big indicator. And so if you look at optimism, which is bullish sentiment, when it falls to an unusually low level, which in statistical terms, it's more than one standard deviation below average. So right now, the historical average is about 38.5%. If it falls to 28% or lower, that tends to be a bullish sign. Uh, what we've seen is whenever it falls to unusually low level, bullish sentiment that is, uh, the S&P 500 has tended to realize above average and above median returns over the following six months and over the following 12 months. At the other end of the spectrum, when optimism is too high, in this case about 48% or higher, then we've seen the S&P 500 tend to underperform. And I'll, I'll point out, it underperforms, doesn't necessarily sink because over most six month periods, the S&P 500 tends to be up, but you do see the S&P 500 actually realize about three percentage points less in return on a six month basis, and then a slightly bigger gap on a 12 month basis. But I do wanna point out that it's not causal the market doesn't necessarily outperform or underperform because sentiment in our survey is unusually optimistic or it's unusually pessimistic. Rather, it's usually a sign that there's something else going on. If you look at the sentiment survey, I think it was Matt Faber actually mentioned on your show a, a few weeks ago uh, that bear sentiment hit its all-time high in March 2009, right as the uh, housing crisis and that financial crisis bear market was hitting a bottom. But the markets didn't rebound then because bear cement hit an all-time high. It's because the market bottom and valuations had gone too low. So I always suggest when people look at our sentiment survey and they see an unusually high or low ring for sentiment, 
stop and ask yourself, well, what else is going on? What are valuations? What's going on in the economy? What's going on in the broader world that would cause people to either be overly optimistic or overly pessimistic? Because that might be really what you're looking at that could be a driver of stock prices going forward. Well, let's look at where we are today. I took a look just recently. 47% of respondents in the sentiment survey recently characterized themselves as bullish, meaning that they expect the market to be higher in six months. So that's pretty close to that 48% that you referenced. So what, if anything, should we take away from that? Is it is it a contrarian indicator? Yeah, it's interesting. It was, it was actually right at that edge. And when I looked at the how the sentiment surveys I mean, correlate to market returns, I actually went through and figured out, okay, what was unusual at this point in time? So it's easy to do with a spreadsheet. So that numbers actually vary, uh, but it was a constant I could keep. I didn't look at, well, what if it's at 45% of what if it's at 48%? But it was at that level. Um, as of today, we've seen that number drop to about 39%. So it was a pullback. But I do think investors are trying to figure out what's going on. And I think what we saw last week when it hit 47%, we saw some volatility in the market end. And now that earnings season's going on right now, third quarter earnings, I think investors are reacting to the fact that we really didn't have a correction occur. And I think it was almost a sigh of relief, perhaps, that people were expecting stocks to drop. And when they turned around, they realized that maybe some of the pessimism was too high. And so are some people, maybe their pessimism wasn't that they were bearish on the market, but just caused them to be neutral instead of optimistic. More broadly, we often hear individual investors characterized as the dumb money in the market. So, you know, first question is, do you agree with that assessment that individual investors are the least informed or do you think that's overblown? And then uh, I guess my second question is, how has your perception of individual investors, I guess, knowledge of the market, how has that changed through the years as you've observed your membership? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And I, I would say there's probably almost a difference between knowledge or wisdom. And it's probably even more so, you know, access to data versus behavior. Uh, and the reason why I say that is when you look at a lot of people running the institutional money, so the quote unquote smart money. I commonly hear that a lot of professional money managers are hired or fired based on a three year performance. So you have these committees making decisions for pensions, making decisions for endowments, and they're very short term focused, which is a really terrible behavior. Uh, and it makes it tough for, say, people who are following, say, a value strategy that is prone to period of underperformance because they always have to worry about the relative performance. And we even see that mutual fund managers where they're often just trying to stay close to the benchmark or trying to stay just ahead of their benchmark, as opposed to saying, you know what, I'm going to really be active and I'm not going to worry about straying from my benchmark because I know if I stick with the strategy over 10 years, my clients are going to be very happy with my return. So I think there's a lot of bad behavior on the part of the institutional side that really doesn't get talked about. And I also would point out, when you look at the big moves in the market, yes, for individual stocks, say your GameStops, your Bed Bath & Beyonds, your AMC, there are individual investors driving those stock prices. But when you look at the big market moves, it's often institutional investors that are really moving the market. So individual investors, is there varying levels of competence? Is there varying levels of investment knowledge? Absolutely. But I don't think you can necessarily say that individual investors are the dumb money and the institutional investors are the smart money. I think there's a lot of nuance in between and a lot of reality that actually goes on that gets overlooked that's overshadowed by trying to paint both groups with separate brushes. What competitive advantages do small investors have that pros don't? I think the biggest advantage is never having to report your performance. And I cannot understate how big an advantage that is. Because when you're a professional and you have to report your performance, or maybe you're an endowment and you have to, uh, you're running the endowment and you have to report your performance to the board, you're under pressure in terms of that short term performance and you're under pressure to achieve a certain level of return. 
Uh, but when you're an individual investor, you're really saving for your goals, so you're playing a different game. If your goal is retirement, then it really is, at the end of the day, getting enough money saved to fund retirement. And as you transition towards retirement, thinking about, well, I need to start taking withdrawals, so maybe I give up a little bit of return now to ensure that short-term volatility hits the day I retire, I'm not having to sell part of my portfolio. I think it also gives individual investors the ability to follow longer-term strategies, such as small cap value, which has a great long-term track record, but can be very volatile over the short term. And so I think really, if you're going to be a stock investor, an individual stock picker, you really want to be someone who's trying to be truly active. And when I say truly active, I don't mean actively trading, but I mean being different than the index, having a portfolio that looks a lot different than the S&P 500 or looks a lot different than the Russell 2000 because that's where you're going to have your edge going into the stocks that are less looked at, less frequently traded, less talked about. You're going to find more mispricing and that's where you're going to have a bigger advantage. But to invest in those stocks, again, you have to be willing and have to be very comfortable with earning a return that's different than the market. And if you're not comfortable with that, index funds work really well and there's nothing wrong with it. But that just means that you're making a conscious choice not to be an active stock investor, but to take comfort in the role in the index funds. And that's a perfectly fine way to invest. Every person's a little different in terms of their investment preferences, in terms of what type of investing they're comfortable with. So maybe that's a good segue to another topic that we wanted to explore with you, which you've already alluded to, which is investor behavior. And you're quite right. I, you know, individual investors, they don't have that career risk. They can be more long-term minded, stray from the index the way professional investors can't. But there's also that behavioral dimension of being somewhat alone uh, in the positions that they've staked out. And so, you know, that's a good pivot to investor behavior, which you're a student of. I think you're a fan of rules-based investing approaches to help counter some of those negative behavioral impulses. So maybe you can provide some examples of rules-based approaches that work. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a big proponent of rules-based approaches. And one of the examples I use, I make a lot of, I use weight loss quite a bit and physical exercise because really with weight loss, we all know what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to eat our vegetables. We're supposed to you know, watch our calories. We're supposed to exercise. It's just like investing. We all know we're supposed to invest for the long term, keep costs low, but trying to do that in reality is tougher. And the reason why I bring up weight loss is I'm actually in a study. It's called the National Weight Loss Registry. And to be in it, you had to lost 30 pounds and kept it off for over a year. And I'm in it. And the way I got into it, even qualified for it was just process. It was simply measuring out portions. And no one sees me in the kitchen except for my wife with me having measuring cups up, making sure I don't eat too much. But having that process that's repeatable has really worked for me. And I think when you get to investing, it's really about thinking about how am I going to invest and having that process. So to give a good example, I look at my 403B plan AAI is a nonprofit, so we have a 403B plan instead of a 401K plan for those people who are not familiar with the various aspects of the tax code. But I only look at it twice a year. And when I do look at it, I only look to see, are my asset classes, are they within the allocation range? Are they off target by too much? And if they're off target by too much, I rebalance. And the rest of the time, I don't even look at the balance. I don't want to know what the balance is because... What I can't control is how I save and how my discipline. And so, again, same with those barriers to acting. If I don't know what the portfolio is valued at, if I don't know how much that value is swinging, I'm not going to be reactive to it. But I think another example, and I think one of the greatest things that's probably happened for individual investors is Richard Thaler's Save More Tomorrow. That whole concept of auto-enrollment where you're automatically enrolled to your workplace retirement plan and that feature of auto escalation, which means that with every year, or perhaps with every salary increase, what you contribute gets automatically increased, I think is just a massive help to many people because it takes the behavioral component out of it. Things are automatically set up once, and then it's up for each individual worker to go in and change it. And we know, 
humans tend to be creatures of a habit, tend to be creatures of inertia. So once that plan's set up, they're less likely to make that effort, even if it's just sending an email to the HR person saying, hey, change this, they're less likely to do it. So I think anything people can do, again, to set those barriers helps. But the other thing is I'm just a big fan of checklists and just having a simple checklist that every time you go through to make a decision regarding your portfolio, or maybe you're looking at investment, just walking through that every time really starts building that discipline. And it's a good reminder of what you should do each and every time. And checklists have been shown to work in medicine. They've been shown to work in aviation. Uh, they've been shown to work in construction. Uh, one of my favorite examples is actually comes from the band Van Halen. They were known for years for not wanting any green M&Ms in their candy jar. And everyone used to think it was kind of funny. Why would they care about that? Well, it actually was a checklist because I think it was David Lee Roth once said in an interview, we had very complex stage setup. And we knew that if we saw green M&Ms in a candy dish, it meant someone wasn't going through the contract line by line to meet all our specifications. And so it was assigned to our roadies to go and check everything and see what else is missed. So again, just having these little checklists, these little behavior type things can really help discipline quite a lot. There's no reason to keep it all in your head when you can have a process-based approach that makes you what you do repeatable, less emotional, and more disciplined. We've had a long-running rally in stocks and other risk assets. What are some of the mistakes that investors might be inclined to make in an environment like the current one, and how can they protect themselves? Uh, one of my favorite quotes, I think, regarding portfolio allocation comes from James Montier of Asset Manager GMO, which was, if you don't know what the markets are going to do, don't structure your portfolio as though you do. And I think investors commonly make that error. They think they know what's going to happen. Uh, maybe it's because of politics, maybe because it's the economy. Obviously, right now we have the virus, but we all know, and, and you two have worked in the markets long enough to know this as well, the markets never quite behave the way we think they are. And so I think now, I think we are seeing a lot of people reaching for yield or perhaps lowering their allocation for bonds and going more into stocks because they want higher portfolio income. And certainly there's a financial aspect, but we've had this long period of really pretty light volatility. We did have March 2020 where we had that very rapid bear market, but we really have not had a very long, painful bear market like 2008 or we saw uh, back in 2000, 2001. And I think it's easy for people to forget how they felt during those years. And for younger investors, maybe they're millennial, maybe they're Gen Z, or that really have not lived through that as an investor, uh, they don't necessarily understand some of the pain that can inflict and how uncertain and how hopeless or helpless it can make people feel uh, when they're in the middle of this and they're seeing their portfolio going down. So I do think there's that combination of people over predicting what the markets will do and overestimating their ability to stick with a strategy when a down market hits. One strategy that AAII members often enthuse about, I think this is true maybe of retirees more generally, is buying a basket of dividend paying stocks and living off the income. Is an equity only approach appropriate for retirees or do you think they're sort of irrationally latching on to income at the expense of what ought to be other important considerations? You know, it can be. Uh, the secret, though, is to have what's known as a barbell strategy. And Christine, I know you're a big fan of buckets. And a barbell uh, is basically just a two-bucket strategy. And, and our founder, Jim Clunan, uh, talked about such a strategy in his book, Level 3, which he wrote in 2016. And what he's proposed in his book was having most of your portfolio allocated to stocks, but then having about two to four years worth of living expenses held in very safe investments, cash, uh, money market accounts, very short-term treasury bills. And so when the market was doing well, when it was within 5% of its high, you withdraw from your stocks. But when the market was below that level, you withdraw from your safe assets, from your cash holdings. And that 5% number can be moved up or down. But the whole idea is that you had this 
bucket of very safe, non-volatile assets. So if your stock holdings fell in value, you weren't forced to sell when the market dropped. And there's various iterations of that. One argument in terms of retirement is that some people should really lower their allocation to stocks. Uh, Wade Fowl and Michael Keitzes had that V-shape allocation uh, where they call for going down to about 30% equities at retirement. So you're not having to sell stocks early in retirement if a bear market hits. But going back to the subject of having a high dividend allocation, I think if you're going to do that, then you really need to de-risk on the other side and really have this portion of your portfolio that's very conservatively invested. So if you do have a bear market, you're not forced to sell stocks when you're down and you have enough saved so that you're not forced to sell stocks. But the other part of it I'll, I'll add is you also have to look at what your guaranteed cash flow is. So if most of your living expenses are covered by pensions, social security, uh, maybe you have annuity income, then your decision to allocate to stocks is almost a little bit easier because then you're probably thinking more in terms of, I want to leave money for my heirs and maybe I'm using that portfolio income to fund vacations or do some other, other activities that I can cut back on in a bear market. So that does change the equation. So it's not just a simple yes or no answer, should I, should I not do this, but it does depend both on what are you able to do in terms of de-risking and then also do you need to de-risk or do you have other sources of income in retirement that allow you to take more risk with what you do invest. So following up on Jeff's question about income, is there any spot within the income arena that's sort of on your skull and crossbones list where you think there are investment types that are sold based on their outsized yields, but that consistently burn or disappoint investors? I know older adults especially really love current income from their investments. Yeah, in general, I'm not a fan of illiquid investments. Uh, and I know before the pandemic, advisors were trying to sell private real estate investments. In general, I think they tend to be higher cost. I think they tend to be riskier. And they're also harder to value. Uh, my career in finance started off valuing privately held businesses. And I know private equity is a new thing now. And I think it's a mistake to think just because an advisor is offering it or just because it's not offered to a lot of people that it's necessarily better. I think investors really need to stop, look at the cost, look at the returns that are being promised and the yields that are being promised and ask a lot of questions and grip their wallets tight until they get every question answered. Some of these products are probably very good products. So I don't want to say they're all bad, but... I think there's enough risk there that I think investors really need to ask themselves, is there enough upside to this relative to what I could get in a mutual fund or ETF or some other asset I can sell on a dime? Am I being compensated enough to pay the higher fees and to also have my money locked up and have an asset that isn't regularly valued by the markets, but instead is not traded very frequently? And as I said, sometimes there are some good investments, but you also have to stop and ask yourself, you know, is this a really good thing or is this a case to, you know, use a Groucho Mark analogy? Do I want to participate in any investment, private investment that will allow me to participate in? What topic do you think is under discussed and deserves more attention in the field of investing? And conversely, what do you think gets too much attention given its importance in investor success or failure? You know, there's a whole lot to that. Um, you know, the most obvious thing is just that there's just a discussion of being a long-term investor and what's required to be a long-term investor. Um, and, and that stuff makes for boring TV. Uh, so you don't hear about it a, a really a lot, but that concept of just, you know, not engaging with your portfolio as much, making fewer decisions, and when you make decisions being really rational, um, none of that's exciting. But I think the other end, when you look at the investment media as a whole, there's a focus on really a small number of stocks. I don't know what those stocks are, but you know you can almost imagine some of them. Your, your Teslas, your Facebooks, your Twitter. And you know sometimes I'll hear these earnings and they're saying, well, this company reported earnings. And I'm always thinking to myself, so who cares? I'm not buying that stock. And there are people that own those stocks, um, those very popular stocks, and it, I realize those numbers really do matter to them. But I think what doesn't get discussed is that 
there's about 5,000 publicly traded companies. And that's not getting into the approximately 30,000 mutual funds, uh, the approximately 2,500 ETFs, and then the thousands of bonds on top of it. So I don't think there's necessarily this talk about, you know, there's this huge sandbox of investments that nobody's even talking about. And maybe you should go take a look at those because there might be some things in there that are really mispriced and perhaps bargain priced. And so it's almost a good analogy is going to the store. What they put there very front of the store is the stuff they want to move, generally higher priced items. And that clearance rack, you have to go find it. It's way in a corner. You know, it's probably crowded, not easy to get to. But where are you going to find the better deal on a shirt or a pair of slacks? Well, it's going to be going digging into that clearance rack. And when you think about investments, you're going to probably find that better bargain if you start looking where nobody else is. But you don't tend to see that talked about. You don't tend to see managers, fund managers, or money managers who go looking in those areas really being called you know, into the investment media and come out and saying, here's an investment you never heard of, but I like it. And the reasons they list why they like it are characteristics that many people would probably like at. So I, I don't think that gets talked about enough. And for those of us who do look in that area, it's actually probably a benefit because it gives us a better chance to outperform because there's less competition to find those bargains. So what are your go-to resources for staying current on investing? Uh, you know, there's quite a lot. I do read the Wall Street Journal uh, daily. I do contribute uh, content to them on their panel of expert panelists. But I also, I, I'm a reader, so I do read New York Times. I do look at Kiplinger's magazine. But I also look at a lot of research on the SSR and website, probably monthly going through various research reports. NBER, the National Bureau of Economic Research, I look at what they're putting out. I do look at various retirement newsletters as well. You know, now that it's coming up tax season, uh, because I write our tax guide, I do pay attention to tax Twitter. Um, and that's an actual hashtag people can use. Uh, I'm actually one of those brave people who does actually look at the IRS website uh, this time of year to see what they're putting out. But I'm also an avid reader, and I joke I'm probably much more of a bookworm than I'll ever care to admit to. So I do read quite a lot of books, mostly nonfiction, and quite a number either dealing with finance or dealing with investing. Well, Charles, this has been such a great conversation. We really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to be with us today. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Us too. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us on The Long View. If you could, please take a moment to subscribe to and rate the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow us on Twitter at Christine underscore Benz. And at S-Youth1, which is S-Y-O-U-T-H and the number one. George Cassidy is our engineer for the podcast, and Carrie Gretchik produces the show notes each week. Finally, we'd love to get your feedback. If you have a comment or a guest idea, please email us at thelongview at morningstar.com. Until next time, thanks for joining us. This recording is for informational purposes only and should not be considered investment advice. Opinions expressed are as of the date of recording. Such opinions are subject to change. The views and opinions of guests on this program are not necessarily those of Morningstar, Inc. and its affiliates. Morningstar and its affiliates are not affiliated with this guest or his or her business affiliates unless otherwise stated. Morningstar does not guarantee the accuracy or the completeness of the data presented herein. Jeff Patak is an employee of Morningstar Research Services, LLC. Morningstar Research Services is a subsidiary of Morningstar, Inc and is registered with and governed by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Morningstar Research Services shall not be responsible for any trading decisions, damages, or other losses resulting from or related to the information, data analyses, or opinions, or their use. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. All investments are subject to investment risk, including possible loss of principal. Individuals should seriously consider if an investment is suitable for them by referencing their own financial position, investment objectives, and risk profile before making any investment decision. Oh.